Welcome back to another episode of the Two Dates in a Dash podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kubler. On today's episode, I interview Grant Wiley, former All-American linebacker at West Virginia University, turned actor, artist, musical producer, basically the ultimate liver of life. Now sit back and relax and enjoy this episode of the Two Dates in a Dash podcast. What is up, podcast land? Welcome to another episode of the Two Dates in a Dash podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kubler. Before I introduce my man, Grant Wiley, I want to first tell everybody where they can hear the podcast. Um, if you're on the audio platforms, pretty much anywhere you can hear a podcast, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Pandora, iHeart, you name it, that's where you can find it. All you got to do is uh, search Two Dates in a Dash. All I ask is that you subscribe and hit the automatic download button because then you don't have to worry about um, reminding yourself to check and see if there's any new episodes. And it also helps me as far as my metrics and shit like that. So uh, YouTube, Matt Kubler, go to my name and that's my channel. Um, you can find all the video versions of the podcast, put, plus a bunch of other video that I put out, some of which you may or may not like, depending on your conspiracy theory level. Um, but that's where I have all that stuff. All I ask is that you subscribe there as well and then hit that little automatic bell thingy majiggy there that lets you know when a new episode is live. Um, where you can learn more about me, mattkubler.com. If you go there, you can learn more about my career, my leadership development stuff, my mentoring stuff for kids. Um, if you want me to come speak, that kind of thing. And you can also learn about the book I wrote back in 2006 called A Brother's Love a Memoir, which is my... Life story growing up with my brother, Andy, who was uh, autistic, had a severe stutter. Um, and it's just uh, the greatest thing I've ever done in my life because sadly my brother died in 1989 in a car accident. And um, it's just my life with him through my eyes and how I saw him. And uh, he was the greatest person I ever knew. And if you wanna learn more about that, just go to mattkubler.com or you can go to Amazon or wherever else you can buy online books. I wanna do a special plug today book just came out last week. Uh, for those of you that follow me on YouTube um, and pay attention to anything I do on social media, which is very minimal now since I've been banned from just about everywhere, um, I did a, and still I'm involved in an investigation in the United States Navy SEALs. Um, a buddy of mine who was commander of SEAL Team 4, um, Joe Price, who I went to high school with, graduated with, um, was killed. They said it was suicide, but I've, I've determined it wasn't suicide, and I was able to prove that. Sadly, the Navy doesn't care, but he, uh, in December 22nd, 2012, he was commander of SEAL Team 4 and uh, died in his bunk from a single gunshot wound to the head. And uh, I was able to determine that he did not self-inflict that gunshot wound. So anyways, long story short, through my travels and investigations, I became friends with a investigative reporter who works for The Intercept named Matt, Matthew Cole, who recently wrote a book called Code Over Conduct. It is a tell-all book about SEAL Team 6 and the corruption and war crimes that they've committed since 2002, um, a lot of which I've talked about on my YouTube channel. Um, it's sad that, you know, the elite fighting forces of our country, and I'm a veteran. I love the military. I love my country more than you can even imagine. But what I don't like is when people take our flag and everything that our country stands for and then use it for nefarious reasons. And that's kind of what's been going on in the Navy SEALs and that I've uncovered dealing with my buddy's uh, suicide slash murder. And Matthew Cole has written an amazing book called Code Over Conduct. So I hope everybody goes out and gets that. It's a New York Times bestseller already. And uh, it's a great book. So without further ado, Grant, what's up, buddy? What's up, brother? Thank you for having me. Great Ooh. background story by you too. Well, thank you. Very fascinating. Well, so a little backstory. So I'm a police officer in, in the area where, where Grant grew up, and I've known who he was. Clearly, um, he was a stud football player at Perk Valley High School, went on to West Virginia, um, had a stellar career there, was a consensus All-American his senior year in 2003, um, played for the Vikings for two seasons, sadly injury plagued, and uh, now is doing great things. But growing up in Perk Valley, and, and I'm 10 years older or so than you, and I pay attention to high school football, always been fascinated. And with, with, with my side business, I had Max out. We trained a lot of football players and a lot of Perk Valley football players. So I knew who you were and I knew who your parents were and, and that you grew up in the area. And recently, your mom had a spill on her bicycle. Yeah. And uh, I was the cop on duty when she fell. And um, we got to chatting while we were waiting for the ambulance. And thank God she's okay and recovering. 
And thank and, you for helping her. <laughs> my pleasure. She's a great woman. I see her every day riding the bike. She's just a she's a speed demon on that on that. You should give her a ticket or whatever. For not it is. wearing her helmet. <laughs> and then your dad and I were at it. We belonged to the same cigar club, and um, we were talking the other night. And then all of a sudden, I get a message from a mutual friend stating that you wanted my cell phone number. And we've had some really in depth, amazing conversations over the last week. And uh, you're, you fascinate me with your breadth of knowledge about many different things. And I'm, I'm sure we're going to touch on a bunch of them tonight. And there is no time limit for the record. This doesn't have a beginning or an end time. I usually determine when the flow is kind of starting to get stale that I know when it's time to find a spot to wrap it up. And, uh, but I don't think we're going to have that much difficulty keeping the flow going tonight. So you and I don't really know each other. We have about a week's worth of, although I, I would say we spent a lot more time talking in the last week than I spent with a lot of other people over the last 10 years, but I'm fascinated by who you are and what you, you would think that, as this elite football player and this elite athlete that in your mind, you have a picture of who this person would be. And you've taken that image of the elite athlete, especially a linebacker for Christ's sake. And you turn it on its head. No, 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 not just a linebacker, a meathead. Meathead. Right. But you turn it on its head. head. Yeah. But you did that one eighty. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, you know, before we do the, I ask you the question, how did, how hard was that transition coming from athlete, to the art, music, acting world that you got into shortly thereafter? Was it an easy transition for you or did, or did you struggle with that? So you mentioned earlier, my career was plagued by injury, which is true. Uh, I think what happened with me, uh, my best friend was killed my junior year at the peak of my career in terms of going to the NFL. Right. And when the fragility of life hits you, something happens, at least for me. Um, you know, I had been around, you know, grandparents passing, friends of my parents passing, but then it, this was my first, like this was my younger brother or who I looked at as my younger brother. He passed, uh, remember Tim Smith, shout out. He was a great athlete, wrestler, district champ, goes to Lehigh. He passed the week I was playing Wisconsin uh, at Wisconsin. And in terms of the NFL, that was the biggest game of my career because they had Joe Thomas, some other big names across the line that we're all going to play in the NFL. And, and that's how the NFL decides, OK, can he play at this level against guys, you know, that are three times the size of him? Um, and then they had a Heisman Trophy running back. So I was gearing up for that game. I get the call. Uh, on a Tuesday and it was confirmed Tim passed um, and being away from um, familiarity with being home or things I can associate to him I was really in my head just trying to make sense of it but also using football to kind of deny it or not so much deny it as much as oh, I can just focus on on football and not not be distracted by this thing and and I, I hear myself talking now it's like I was thinking I was being distracted when one of my best friends was passing away because I was so focused on football um, so what happened I was at the game we lost um, and then I saw my parents my brother my sister and two close friends of mine came to the game in Madison and an energy came through me and I just lost it right was in complete hysterical crying on my mom um, and then I got onto the bus shortly after not a whole not not many of my teammates knew what was going on it wasn't you know social media wasn't around I wasn't I didn't have the tools, one, to understand how powerful expre expressing yourself and talking to someone was. And I'm still in that, yeah, I'm being tough football player. Uh, can't show emotion unless it's conquest. Right. And um, then I was on the bus and one of my teammates looked at me. He's like, yo, gee, this was just a game. And something clicked in me immediately. I was able to 
collect myself and, and catch my breath. And I just realized, I was like, this is just a game. He thought it was because I was upset oh. because we right. lost. I was like, I, that was like the furthest thing from, from my mind at the moment. Um, and that really turned me inward the the very beginning right it was like as a kid i would ha always had these abilities to reflect and and see things and then as i started to channel my focus and my instincts fully on football it was about that um but this kind of blew my excuse excuse me blew my head open on some level and my heart and i just started to think about things and and it was the beginning of me not taking things so for granted, no pun intended on my own name. Uh, and so with that, he and I had dreams, uh, you know, I was going to go to the league. I was going to take care of everything and we were going to build an entertainment empire. Ultimately, he was an incredibly talented uh, hip hop artist in terms of writing, reciting, just flow, all that, and, and as well as an athlete. And one of the things that he always showed me was his fearlessness. Uh, he was from an interracial background. His, his father was Jamaican, mother's Caucasian. And or, is that okay? Like PC? I, I don't know. I don't yeah, know. You said it right. Terms. You said it right. Yeah. Okay. We don't know. We don't know. Right now, I think that's safe. <laughs> and I, I don't want to offend anybody. I'm just going to tell it how I know it. Well, for the record, I usually offend somebody every time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I think it's it's challenging in this day and age, yeah. and respect everyone. Uh, but he had this uh, growing up in Collegeville Trap. He had this um, just from being born to parents of of different race and being in a predominantly Caucasian area. He always was challenged with who am I? Mm -hmm. And I was always, I always admired his fearlessness and his ability to just drop and be himself and forget about that. But I, you know, he and I would have intimate conversations as far as we could in terms of, you know, things that we thought about or struggled with or, or whatever. And, and, and we just tried to be there for each other. And so reflecting on that and then just getting to the point where I had a real um, dark night of the soul. One of, the, one of my first experiences, I was uh, 13 tackles a game my junior year. I'm considered the top three linebackers coming out in that draft. Mel Kuyper Jr. is calling me once a week. Gary Wishard was going to be my agent. He had the best defensive roster in the NFL at the time and helped change the landscape of how defensive linemen are being paid. Jason Taylor was his guy, the first $100 million defensive lineman. So I had this whole, my dream was, was right here uh, as this NFL football player, which I said I was going to do since I was four years old. Not to say that there weren't many challenges before that, which there were many. Uh, including my own behavior. It's a good thing you weren't around. <laughs> we may have known each other sooner uh, if you were the college real cop uh, when I was in my adolescence. So going back to that season, I was the tools I knew to cope or to grieve was my brothers on my team, and, and a few of them, right? Because we naturally gravitate or around who we're around. There's a hundred plus guys on the team. So it was really my core brothers. And then I was a big fan of alcohol. Uh, and so I was using that and drunk on my own success uh, and just lack of introspection. And I came home one night and we had my sophomore year when we we had an away game at Notre Dame we got robbed we came home and our house was cleaned out of a lot of electronic appliances xbox stuff like that it didn't really matter but it it, it is kind of troubling when you come home from a game and your house is cleaned out and so um at that point in time 
I committed to a different lifestyle of being, which involved the idea of street, right? Like guns, you know, gangster stuff. And that's just where I was at. And so we had a gun in our couch and I was always fascinated with guns. Uh, they're very powerful. You have to kids, anyone listening, know what you're doing before you put one in your hand. Um, there is a use for them, uh, but you have to know and understand the safety protocols when it comes to it. Cause at that time, I didn't even know what I was doing when I was picking up. Fortunately, I was shown safety and all that. Uh, but we had that for, uh, you know, potential robberies or, or whatever. It's not really, uh, it wasn't really the best way to go about it, especially it being in our couch. But long story short, I went out to the bar um, that night. I think it was a it was a Saturday night and we may have had a buy, but I always had a lot of people in, in my apartment. I had two roommates and then we had the apartment where if if you needed to eat, you came to our apartment because we didn't cook for just the three of us. And it was usually me cooking. I cooked for everybody, your cousin, your mom, your dad, like whoever needed to eat, your brother, whatever, come through, you know, you had a plate. And so we always had a really busy house. And on this evening, I was should not have driven first and foremost drinking and driving is is not a good thing to do um, this is 2002 and I had this for the first time I walked in and it was this silence in the house and I was looking around, I was like there's nobody here and I was hammered right whatever I drank and I was just looking around and something very calm came over me. But I remember we had these sliding glass doors and no lights were on inside, but you could see this, the, the glare of the street lamps is very cinematic. And it was just that light coming in off our porch. And I remember... And I remember for the first time I started talking to myself, I was like, none of this means anything to me. Like this number six, like all these tackles, what am I doing? My dream, my best friend's dead, like all these going on in my mind. I was like, none of this means anything to me. And I actually bought a BB gun uh, months prior to this moment, just so I had something to satiate that desire of fiddling around with a with a real gun and instead i went and i pulled out the piece from the from the couch and i just thought to myself i was like wow i was like i can just end it all right now and as i started to raise the piece this hysterical laughter and crying just consumed me i don't know where it was coming from but it was similar to what i experienced after the wisconsin game and i just trusted it and it was one of the first times i had this this very loud voice going off telling me that this was just the beginning this was just the beginning so i carefully put the piece away I went to sleep and I woke up stone sober with an extraordinarily vibrant energy as if I didn't do what I did at the, at the bar earlier. And to this day, I'm just very respectful of that energy and, and, and what that lesson or what that was trying to teach me. And I don't believe uh, I believe in suicidal thoughts, but I don't believe it's necessarily ending our earthly existence. I, I do believe very much that it's a part of ourselves that is showing up for us to grow right. and death to that part of ourselves that's holding us back from expanding into a new version of ourselves. So it was moments like that. Um, as well as one of the biggest plays I ever made 
uh, in my college career down at Virginia Tech on the goal line. I jumped over the offensive line. I just remember saying to my teammate, I have to make this play. I was like, no one else, I have to do this. And James Davis, he looks, he's like, he's like, that's right. He had this this Stewart Florida act. He's like, that's right, Wilder. You got to do it. You got to do it. Lee Suggs, right? Like, uh, yeah, Lee Suggs. Mm -hmm. And he was the most prolific scoring running back in the country at the time. He scored a touchdown earlier in our game. And I was just like, I know they're giving him the ball. I was like, what are the probabilities? I, If I was the head coach, I'd give him the ball too because he's proven it time and time again. And whatever that similar energy from um, that left me the Wisconsin week and then – before this game, I had the moment with the piece. I blacked out. I jumped over the offensive line. I hit him. I turned around. He was down. And then I went back to the sidelines in the same, that same otherworldly stream was coming through. I was like, I don't know what this is, but I need to live here because this is awesome. Right. And so those those moments in a nutshell there's a bunch of other stuff that that happened but just trying to keep a timeline together those moments really started to help me understand what i am right just a little bit and what am i doing and actually asking myself the question as opposed to just being steered by a coach or a teammate or a family member and just really get to who is me? Who am I? What am I doing here? What do I want out of this experience? It's a great transition. And, I'm glad that you, uh, I, you, you don't want me to go. Well, no, but I want to ask you the question because I think what you just talked about. So the, there was, this was like the birthing of the beginning of, of your self-awareness and your understanding of where your being is in the earth, like where you, your, your role and position is and, and the direction that you were going to head down. And I ask everybody the same question, and I can't not ask you this question. I don't want to get 40 minutes into a podcast before I ask it to you. Yeah. Because I think it's important because you just sort of talked about who you were at one stage of your life. And I asked this question specifically the way that I ask it, because as a cop, typically I, when I'm talking to somebody, I'm, I'm either talking to a suspect or a victim or a witness, right? And I don't really know much about them. I don't know what it is they saw or did or accused of or are a victim of, but I have to get them to open up to me. So I ask broad questions in order to get the, an understanding of where their brain's at at that moment when I'm talking to them. So yeah. I can peel off the onion to get down to the root of what I need. But it gives me, if you start broad and work small, it's a lot easier than trying to narrowly ask specific questions about specific things without knowing anything about the person and the personality of the person before you ask that question. So the question I ask everybody, and I'm going to ask you the same thing, is who is Grant Wiley? And it's because I asked that, I don't know who you are today and how you feel about who you are today. I can list your accomplishments and your bio and what's on Wikipedia, but I'm pretty confident that's not who Grant Wiley thinks Grant Wiley is. Hmm. I am an information processing experience having lesson learning, creatively expressing, biological organism, guided by the unseen. Oh, shit. That a might flesh, be. A flesh of the greatest energy we may for a moment know. And I, I, I and I could, ch it could be different tomorrow, but, but what I, in this moment, I'm here having a conversation with my brother, Matt. Um, but ultimately, to me, something that I've learned is, is to describe ourselves. I, I, I don't, I don't, I believe in no limitation, right? They say sky is the limit. Well, it depends how you look at it. It's like, why not go through that limit? Um, but in a nutshell, it's like, yeah, I'm, and information processing, experience having, lesson learning, creatively expressing, biological organism guided by the unseen, a flesh of the greatest energy we may for a no moment know. And that, to me, that's what a lot of those experiences were bringing me to, um, to now. That might be the most. And continued to. 
That might be the most interesting answer I've ever had <laughs> in 130 or whatever we're on right now episodes of the Two Dates in the Dash podcast. And it reminds me, as you were saying it, and as somebody who's in acting world, it, it takes me back to Bull Durham with Kevin Costner when he's like the long, wet guy. I believe in the, the, the I forget the whole speech, but he goes, I believe in the the designated hitter. I believe in, like, he goes through this whole thing. I, I believe in long, wet, passionate kisses. I believe in holding hand. Like, this whole big thing he goes through. As you were saying it the way you were saying it, I was hearing in my head that scene from that movie, which is nice. not anywhere my brain would have normally gone. But, <laughs> yeah, that's where it went. So, from that, and from your opening discussion about how football, how your transition from elite athlete to a self-aware human being who is working through the processes of dealing with life and, and all the things that life gives you. And it's not easy. Like I think, and, 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 and I think this is a really good topic to start with. We live in a world where people have never really had trauma. Like there, there's a, the, at the average human being, doesn't appreciate life because they've never truly experienced the trauma of death. And you talked about you've had grandparents die and and things like trans people that are like people you knew but you weren't necessarily like the most in love with or, or relationship wise with. Yes, they die. Everybody dies. But having that that really close, almost brotherly type person and having experienced this myself having something so close to you be taken from you at a moment when you weren't prepared for it. So when you think what PTSD is, you know, there's people that go to war and, and see the most disgusting, vile things on the planet and come back. Okay. And then there's others that go that are completely fucking mind fucked, right? They, they can't, they can't function in the world. And, and what is the difference between the guy that is operating normally and, and has a processing component in his brain that allows for whatever it is he saw and, to be dealt with properly and those that don't. And I believe it comes down to what were you prepared to witness? And what were you mentally, like you would mentally prepare for a game. You would mm -hmm. visualize just before that play with Lisa, like you visualize yourself making that play. Your expectation was you were going to succeed regardless of what that was, you were gonna make that play. When I, I've been in two shootings and I, can, I visualize them over and over in my mind hundreds and hundreds of times throughout my career. How would I handle that moment? And the moment can be different depending on the scenario, but ultimately the, the, the putting your gun's front sight on a, another human being and pulling the trigger, that's the same no matter what environment you're in. If you have to get to that point, that moment is something you have to prepare for. And I, and I argue that the trauma of losing my brother, who I wasn't prepared to have die at 21 years old in a car accident is 1 million times harder for me to, to wrap my head around and to emotionally handle than anything I've done in my career. Any of the evil things I've seen in my career. I've seen dead babies. I've seen thousands of dead bodies. They don't even register in my consciousness. But I can relive today at, at any moment, the moment that I heard my brother die. I can go back there and I will be as sad and as heartbroken and as distraught and as angry as I was the day that it happened on July 12th, 1989. Because I wasn't prepared. And that breaks you for a little while. That trauma breaks you. And depending on how well your network is, your support structure, structures around you will determine how quickly you're able to put yourself back together. And I think the trauma of losing your best friend sets you on a course of reevaluating life. And I don't know how long that process or period was for you to fully understand what, what happened and what that lesson was that, that you were taught by that, mine was 13 years. How long did it take for you to realize what happened with Tim to, to materialize itself and manifest itself in your life as, as a lesson that you gained knowledge from and wisdom from? Uh, 
I think it still works or it's still working. I don't, cause I don't really believe, or I do what I like to believe in is that it's like, what is science? Science says energy is never created nor destroyed. There's the ideas of reincarnation. There's the ideas, there's all these ideas out there and all these stories. And what I try to do is, keep keep perspective and that was just leading me to perspective is like wow i was like a lot of what he had going on in his life at the time i'm still here now i can ignore it or i can figure out what are these what are these quotes coming into my head from places and you know i'm not schizophrenic i'm discovering more faculty over this this energetic system that i exist in and how can i just keep perspective and get back to the basics of me through these experiences so i don't think it ever stopped it's it, it's ever stopped i don't know that I don't have a definitive answer to the point when I was like, oh, this is wisdom now. You know what I mean? I still believe it's working. I still believe he's here in different ways. I believe people who show up in our lives for, for very important reasons and don't actually leave us because I can go back to that moment when we were driving down to the beach with no beach tags and me and my my other boys we just rushed rushed the beach tag person and we all jumped over the rail and i can see that vividly right and i can hold on to the those moments of of joy and then i can remember remember, remember some of the tougher times and I, so i don't really i believe our memory is that powerful to keep us balanced in a way if we choose to to the good times and then that that heartbreaking time and i do believe heartbreak is also to help us open our hearts yeah. and not close off but realize yes we have a short period of time here we don't necessarily know what's going to happen we can just keep plugging away and getting better as people and and figure out how to better coexist within ourselves to then better coexist with with people around us and so i don't believe it's it's stopped but i do because my dep or the depression it's that's a, the word we use the deep rest right depression continued because i was still able not full grievance but i had all these other things going on so i was back to football i had more games i had uh, more stuff to think about. Am I going to leave my junior year? Am I going to stay for my senior year? And then that whole, uh, because after my junior season, we played in a bowl game. And then I was back home after our bowl game. We got destroyed uh, by Virginia. And I was back home and I was just partying all the time. And now I was with my boys that I was really close with who were also close to Tim. And all we knew how to do was party and just, talk about him and how much we loved him and missed him meanwhile the biggest decision of my life is going on and i don't even know how to think of it <laughs> i just knew it was there and i was just i was doing things to to get away from that to having to think should i leave should i stay i'm deeply attached to my brothers at west virginia i don't want to leave them i want my family to have another year but i also want to go to the league after my junior year because i really wanted to leave after my sophomore year like michael vick after I got the biggest rookie of the year award the year after he did. And I was like, I'm doing that. And then I got injured. And so it was just, I had a, a chaotic storm going on in my mind and I wasn't connected to my heart. So I wasn't able to clearly think in any which direction. And I also wasn't aware of what I was scared of because I was tough guy through everything. Right. And so I was disconnected from my vulnerability because I didn't understand that vulnerability is strength. And it's important to understand our own vulnerabilities and what emotion 
is trying to help us understand or figure out. And so I decided to stay and intuitively I knew I wasn't getting drafted. I don't know why I knew that. I just knew I wasn't. It was a whole different draft class. Vilma, DJ Wood, like all, everybody was projected better than me for whatever reason. But in my mind, I was like, well, if I just have a better year, like statistically, and then we won the championship, I was like, schematically what we were running at the time didn't add up to the league. And I was a different size for that scheme. So it threw a different set of challenges on me as well, where will we put him? And and irregardless of, of the scouts and the the draft, I didn't get drafted. Um, But I was able to sign the free agent deal. I was like, I don't, and I went in with a chip on my shoulder and I had a real communication problem with our, um, our head coach at the time at West Virginia. And it wasn't, it was, I put it on myself because rich Rob? yeah, rich, I had a great deal of respect for him and we won a lot, but I also had uh, a bad attitude in how I was approaching our personal relationship, which I could have dropped and just probably played the game a little better, but I was pissed. I played, I, I, I too much of me on the field carried over off the field. And it was probably a lot of anger and resentment from not understanding how to grieve Mm -hmm. and carrying that uh, disappointment and that um, whatever the emotion was that I, I wasn't expressing was just living on me. And anytime we suppress our emotion, it gets expressed in some way, shape, or form, whether we're conscious of it or not. And so then when I got to the Vikings, I was still pissed and I didn't care. I cared that I was going to show up there and prove that I belonged in this league. But I wasn't listening to the wise men totally. I didn't. I wasn't really hearing what Brian Russell and, and some of these and Matt Burke and some of these guys were trying to help me understand about how this league worked. Um, At the same time, I was proving every day that I could play in the league and that I was worth keeping, keeping on the roster, which is why my rookie year, I tore my rotator cuff and they kept me, on the, on the 53 man roster as a rookie free agent undrafted with a torn rotator cuff. So I was doing something right. And then um, that year was special because I got to rest. Now it's not the ideal situation where, you know, I had surgery and I was rehabbing, um, but I did get, I got back, I got time back for me. And that was really important because that's when real introspection started to happen. But I was also falling into the old patterns of, you know, using pain pills and drinking and just smoking a lot of weed unconsciously and just numbing a lot of things that I was still dealing with the truth that I was avoiding of what was going on inside of me. And that's when I really started to look at art and I started to think about what is it that I'm afraid of? And I may, I remember making a list. I was like, what am I afraid of? I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid of painting. I'm afraid of singing. I don't like my voice. I thought I sounded like a dumbass. Uh, I need to get my voc. I didn't like my vocabulary. It's like, I didn't like the way I looked. I just wrote out this list of all these things I didn't like about where I was at and what I, who I was being. I didn't like how I was relating to my family, my girlfriend, all of these things. And I was starting to get really real with myself. And um, then I came back out my second season they started moving me up to first team on special teams and anybody knows about the league 
as an undrafted free agent or a low low uh, a low draft pick that's where you cut your teeth and you make your position on special teams i was still too arrogant in my own head but it also drove me to prove that i should be in the starting rotation or at least set too deep um, as a linebacker but they moved me up the first team uh, kickoff return that training camp and gave me a real number. <laughs> when I first went, they gave me 66. I was like, all right, fuck you. I'll wear 66. And you know what? When I make the team, I'm going to keep 66. Like that, that was my mentality. And I'm going to be this, wear this throwback number if they allow it as, as this, this linebacker for the Vikings. I thought that'd be pretty cool, actually. And then they gave me 91 my second year. And that's, I actually thought 91 was a cool number. Uh, some people think it's trash. I just, I think, I love the single digit as a linebacker in college because very few linebackers anywhere were single digits. So I like that, that uh, okay. kind of different number look. And 91 made me look taller. Uh, <laughs> so, I was moved up to first team and I was a wedge. I was part of the wedge, which is the last place I wanted to be. The banged up shoulder too. So <clears throat> yeah. And and I'm you look at the wedges now, it's like most of the guys are like six three, two eighty. Like right. they put tight ends there, they put defensive ends, they put edge rushers. Um, but I was there, I was like, fuck it, let's go. So we didn't have um, – we had shorts on too. So I was like, well, you know, we're not going to go full tilt. But this free agent rookie defensive lineman from Rutgers, I forget his name, he was 6'2", 300 pounds, and was trying to prove himself running down on kickoff. And when somebody that size is running at you full speed, you try to pick a shoulder – but like I said, he was trying to prove himself. So he just ran right through me. And it was a, it was a shoulder pad drill. So it's not, it wasn't live, but you still, you're on the football field. And it was that moment I flew back, hit my head, my shoulder jiggled out. And I was just like, I'm done. <laughs> I was just like, this is a wake up call. And it's not that I didn't want to continue playing. I just, I had always told myself, I was like, when I get to the point where I'm not okay being in the training room, not because I want to be injured all the time, but you live a lot of your career in the training room. Some guys are, don't, and, and that's few and far between. But if you're not okay with that, then, which I, at the time, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted. And again, I'm on my back. I'm laughing and crying that similar energy from earlier is going through me. And I was just, I, I was hysterically laughing because I knew I was done. And this voice was going off in my head. It's time to act. It's time to act. It's time to act. And the trainers are out there. They're like, oh, grass. Like, as soon as they got to me, I was like, I'm done. And I'm still on my back. And they're like, no, no, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to see what's going on and we're going to we're gonna get you off the silence. Let's, let's go. You're not, you're not done. You're not done. I was like, no, I was like, you guys don't get it. I'm good, but I'm, I'm done. And then fortunately uh, they were great too. the, the training staff down there. And I, they had known me fairly well from the year before because I was in there every day. And uh, I was just, I knew it was it. And even leading up to um, leading up to that training camp, I was watching The Wire. This is when TV was being revolutionized. Sopranos, The Wire, like these. I don't understand. I don't know if many people or there's people that do get it, but those TV shows changed TV without a doubt. It's cinema became television now. And I remember saying to my roommate, uh, Anthony Herrera, shout out, I love him. I haven't spoken to him in a while, but one day uh, I used to say to him while we would be playing uh, video games after, after our workouts, I'd be like, bro, I was like, I want to be on the wire. He's like, all right. 
I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to be on the wire. I want to, I want to paint. Like I want to do everything I'm afraid of because there's something there. I don't know if it's that. I feel like it's that, but there's something there. And he's like, well, go do it. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, but we got training camp coming up. I'm going to, I'm going to give this as long as I could go. Cause it's great money. It's a dream. Uh, I was over all the, the bullshit, meaning the, like the, the glamour. I was like, it's not that glamorous. It's like the money's great, but the tax you put on your body and your mind and, and, going back to something you asked the prep or you mentioned the preparation going into a game. I don't know what it's like to be in war, like getting shot at, but I imagine at some point I was telling myself horrific things that the offense of the university of Miami did to family and people I loved in order to get me into that space of I'm a wolf and I'm going to eat and I'm going to, I'm going to tear up whatever comes into my direction and they're bigger than me. And I'm okay with that because I have this thing that I'm willing to unleash on them and I will enjoy the pain that I inflict on the, and, and this is the mindset in the locker room, listening to Rage Against the Machine, Tupac, like Wu-Tang, every, anything to get me into that space of, of, of kill or be killed, right? And that's also very taxing, part of what I'm getting at. Um, but back to the me realizing what I truly wanted to pursue and then going back on the field and and re-injuring my shoulder <clears throat> i i knew i was done that same energy like i said came back to me and then i started to realize oh that's my intuition right ding 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 and i was not i knew football and that world and that's what i was creating in and then I started to realize, I was like, oh, let me, let me figure out how to stay there and stay connected to, and, and align with that because there's something to this. And one of the most beautiful things that happened to me when I knew I was done, I go into the meeting with, with Coach Tice and they were going to keep me again. They're like, look, he was like, just straight up. He's like, look, um, you're the last one on the list. You're number 54 or something like that. Um, but if something happens to another guy, we're going to, we're going to try and keep you around as long as possible. And I said, coach, uh, I appreciate that. Um, but I'm also interested in the injury settlement. And he knew what that meant. He knew, uh, he's like, yeah, you think, you think you're done? And I was like, uh, I'm pretty, pretty sure I'm done. He's like, well, just hang out a little bit. If, you know, if, and, and we'll see. I was like, all right, I'll hang. So sure enough, Erasmus James was the number one pick that year. He signed, he needed the spot. So then I go in the meeting. I was like, He's like, you're sure about this? I was like, yeah. He's like, well, you know, had very complimentary things to say. Uh, he was very good to me and also very surprised at, which was fun, seeing right. this head coach surprised at some of the shit you were doing on the field. Uh, I wasn't surprised. Um, but then when I was in, because we were in Mankato, and then when I was in, I was, I knew this is my last day because they were taking a, a shuttle to the hospital for people that needed MRIs and stuff like that. And I got to see if I was to create a list of who I wanted to talk to before I left forever, because that's ultimately was going on. A chapter of my life was, was closing. I got to talk to Randy. I got to talk to Matt Burke, Jim Kleinsaster, 
Rosenthal, Kelly Cam, um, Sean Burton was my my roommate at the time, and everyone that really impacted me um, f- through that experience. Brian Russell, I was able to see and thank and say goodbye to, and and the last person was Matt Burke, and he's a Hall of Famer, Hall of Fame guy, uh, first and foremost, at least to me. He. I saw him, I was like, he's like, and he's, this is a Harvard grad, right? Seventh round pick, had no business, had no business really being in the league, plays for what, 17 years, wins. I think he won two Super Bowls or at least one with the Ravens. I I think that's the two he was with. And he looked at me, he's like, you're going to be all right, aren't you? And I was like, yeah. I was like, Matt, I was like, I watch you with your kids. And you hold your kids over their head. I was like, if I keep doing this, I was like, I may not be able to do that one day. And he looked at me. He's like, yeah, you're going to be all right. And I was like, yeah. I was like, now I just got to go figure out what the fart I'm going to (laughs) do. And so literally driving in that, that, but the shuttle, was like driving off into the sunset because Minnesota is very dark except summertime and you got three months and it's pretty picturesque, gorgeous in the summertime. And on that single road, the sun was straight ahead. It was like a movie moment where I'm sitting there. I was like, I'm done. Like I was, I was really happy that all that, all that, exhaustion the pain the frustration everything just left and now i was like i have a clean slate and i was really really excited about that and and really um happy how it ended in regards to and i could have come back like that's the thing people say oh well you know your career ended because of injury i was like well you know at some point you got to listen to your body um I could have I could have continued to rehab for a while and come back, but I was just like I'm not I'm not there. It's I always say this. People ask me, "Is like, well, you know, I don't have kids, but when I do have kids, are you going to let your sons play football?" I was like, if they're as crazy as I was as a kid, and they have that same drive, of course, but it's not for the faint of heart. And it takes an extraordinary amount of work. Um, And the body is genius. This is what people go amiss, like, because they hear somebody talk or they see people and the way they make decisions in their lives. It's like athletes, professional athletes have a level of genius to them because they've worked this intelligent system into that. Same thing with soldiers. It's like, you can't be dumb. Now, you may not be able to do physics, but, you know, I'm sure if you studied physics in the same way that you you prepared for football or prepared for the military, and until you could learn physics, it's like, but I just want to make it clear that there is a genius to the body and to being able to get it to perform at, at this professional level. Let me ask you this. So you touched on something with that, you know, hearkening back to when you were playing football about how you would get yourself mentally prepared to play against someone and how you would go to that, that access that level of violence required to be the most dominant player on the football field. There's a similarity, and there are similarities between combat sports and combat in mental preparation and physical preparation. Um, obviously there's life or death components that are a little bit more extreme on the combat side versus combat sports, but there is still the risk of severe bodily injury or death when you're playing football, right? You're throwing yourself around against, you know, chiseled human beings made out of muscles and uh, any more this day, today's age, they're all, you know, superhuman athletes almost compared to even when you were playing. It's, it's Adonis across the board. If you watch, you turn on, turn on the, uh, the The combine. combine. 
and then go back to the combine in 2005. Yep, totally and different. Just look at the difference. I mean, these are freaks out there. And if you're not a freak, you're not even getting invited. Right. So one of the things more that, so than back then. So when you when you access so the the point I'm getting to is that there is a um, it's a rare feat, and it's a it's a trained muscle, I believe. Um, when someone and I, I talk about masculinity a lot on on some of my podcasts and the stuff I do on YouTube and talking about um, the value of having a violent side where that value is in being able to access if need be, but only using it in a controlled way that um, affords you to, to accomplish whatever the task is that requires it in front of you. And then putting that away, I call it controlled aggression. Uh -huh. um, not many people know how to control that, know how to put it, use it and put it away in a safe place to where it's not bubbling up when you drink or when you get angry at your wife or your girlfriend or your kids, like how you can use it and put it away. Were you, did you find yourself having difficulty when you were in college, specifically because that's when you're playing your most games, accessing that and then putting it away and not having it bubble up in inopportune times? Fortunately, I don't like fighting off the field. Right. On the field, I'll get down with anybody. Off the field, I just don't, I don't like fighting. I've done it. I've been in it more to protect myself and other people. I'm just not a fan of it because you can die. At least I know on the field, if we get into a fight, the worst case scenario is I, I break a bone or tear a ligament or, you know, worst case is brain damage, right? But I'm also hitting with my head. So, and back then it's like, that's, you knew if you hit with your head, that's how you got people. Um, fortunately, I'm, I'm not, I don't have any severe, if mild, um, issues from, from hitting with the head. Now, did I find at times, at times, because it's on the surface, it's like when you're training every single day and my goal was to be the baddest motherfucker on the field every single time I stepped out on the field. So I feel like I had that arena to express that side of me. And I feel like it's helped me similarly to martial arts, right? When you know you can destroy someone and you know what this elbow can do when it's orchestrated properly at an opponent, I feel like you understand for the most part that you don't really want to do that. Now, emotional intelligence is a real thing. And sometimes we can get carried away for egotistical reasons or, oh, you disrespected me. I got to prove myself because you haven't had that outlet of real battle. Now, if you've gotten your ass kicked, you know, it's not always worth it to step into that space. And I've had guns pulled on me. I've had knives bland or what's the word? Blandish, brandished, brandished. brandished. Um, and it's not cool. And in fact, you feel really hopeless, especially if you're not with an instrument. <laughs> so I did at time at have moments of I'm this big badass. You step to me and see what happens in my mind. And then you got to think it's like because I'm thinking that people are there are people out there that want to prove themselves to this superstar football player or whatever you you know we are. And and sometimes you get caught up. And that's a what's the cliche was the word that we were thinking about. Oh, the yeah. Other day. Okay. Yeah. Cliche. The cliche is be careful what you, what you wish for. Right. And so I learned through some not so fortunate experiences. And then going back to my, my best friend, you learn like it could end in a bar brawl. 
And so I, I, I was, I'm happy that I am not, don't get me wrong. I enjoyed hitting. I wanted, like I said, I prepared to be the baddest motherfucker on the field. And in that state, if because I had that arena and football was fun to me because you don't get arrested for hitting people. And I had an insane amount of rage um, that I needed to, I needed to express and I needed to express and I needed to express. And I feel like because, and I'm glad you brought up the word masculinity because in society we're taught this one way of being, but the last time I checked, we all had a mother and we all had a father. Therefore, we all have masculine energy. We all have feminine energy. And I was so out of balance with the amount of masculine energy that I was committing to everything. I would have moments of the feminine side and I would early on deny it or instead of accepting these feminine moments I would have with my girlfriend at the time, I would turn on the tough guy. And it wasn't until over time that I realized I was playing the role of a tough guy. I wasn't, no one's always this tough meathead, right? Um, but I was, I was over, over expressing that masculine side or what I thought it was to be a man and being a man doesn't mean you're always out there kicking ass. It's just not what it is. Agreed. And I believe martial arts is a great tool, a great discipline, similar to the jujitsu's when you're in the military, you're, it's a lot of masculine energy, but you also are exposed or in the police force a lot of masculine energy but you're exposed to that so much at some point you got to think to yourself when can i turn this shit off and i that was part of the part of me that was being exhausted through football and i say i feel like i'm i'm fortunate because i was able to purge that shadow and exercise it and realize i have a terror inside of me and I need to get, get some peace with that because one day it may come in handy survival. Right. And, and I know I can go there, but I've, I've done enough work and had that experience and many experiences to exercise it, to know that I don't have to live in that space 24 hours a day. It's, it's really exhausting. It is. And, and I, I bring it up because of the fact that there is this expectation. You know, I'm 51 in a month and I've 32 years in, in military and law enforcement and I've seen my fair share of violence and I've committed my fair share of violence. And understanding when you go through a trauma and that trauma isn't dealt with and yet you're in that environment where you're constantly having to... Um, whether it's playing a role or, or adapting to the environment that has required you to um, act a certain way, whether it's you're the star football player or the, the tough soldier or the white guy or whatever I was doing at the time during my period of 13 years where I was really just not managing my grief and allowing myself to be really good at my job, but also allowing it to, to manifest itself in, in ugly ways in my personal life. And it, there was a moment, I had an aha moment, not everybody has an aha moment. I had a moment of grace from God that allowed me to release that, that guilt that I felt, that anger that I felt, that um, pain that I felt. And from what I, you know, our, our, our talks we've had this week and then just tonight, it sounds like yours has been an incremental growth process. Like I had a, I went and I'm an extremes guy. Like I'm, I'm all in with everything. I don't half-ass anything. I don't half-step anything. If I commit, I'm all in and usually it's for life. And for me, I was so, and my brother died in July. I went in the army in August. 
So I didn't have a period of time to, to grieve. You were in college playing football in West Virginia when your best friend died. You weren't, you Check weren't. This out. My best friend died. My roommate's grandmother died that raised him. And my other roommate's father died in a motorcycle accident within three months. Jeez. And nobody, and that, that, that weighs on your soul. So for me, I decided that I was never going to deal with it. I was just going to become the baddest motherfucker in whatever it is I was doing at the moment. And I was just going to dominate that. Well, the problem was I met the woman of my dreams, had a daughter that I couldn't love because I didn't know how to express that. I didn't know how to have that emotional connection with my wife or my daughter. Went through my life having bits of rage that I'm not proud of and that I didn't have control over. I control in my environment of law enforcement, the military, but I didn't have control over when it wasn't directed intentionally at, on an order, right? Go do this. Well, I can go do that and I can do it really well and very violently, but I couldn't handle my own emotions to keep myself from exploding at inopportune times. And when I had that, that moment of grace, it released that at least the process started of releasing it. It was, it was a definitive moment kind of like your emotional release when you saw your mom after the wisconsin game and after making that play and against virginia tech and after you know you decided you were done with football at minnesota like those that i had that and i had that complete but mine lasted eight hours and it turned into this book mm -hmm. i wrote twenty six thousand words that night and it was just an emotional you wrote that in one night 26,000 words of it. Yeah, that's 68,000 word, 68, word book. And I wrote 26,000 in one night. But it was just like, I, I was like possessed with emotion. And then- That was part of your grieving process. Yeah, that, that was my release. It was my, right. I had to relive my brother's life because I was, I'd stopped thinking about the person that I grew up with. And I started hating the man that, the, the thing that took him, which was God. And I didn't have- forgiveness in my soul. I didn't have love. I didn't have anything. So it wasn't until that happened to me. There was no incremental. It was death of my brother, full tilt, adrenaline and, and rage in a productive way that looked good in the military and in law enforcement. And then my aha moment, but that was a 13 year period. Hmm. And that, that allowed me then to then understand what I went through. So you're very retrospect, introspective and retrospective and understanding the reasons why a lot of things happened to you and how those moments were integral in your growth as a person. Was there a point in time where that knowledge that, because I don't know whether or not you knew at that moment with that overflowing of of emotion after the, the game with Virginia Tech, that that was your moment that you were going to start growing from. But was there a moment when you physically said or emotionally or mentally said, yeah, this is kind of when I knew the trajectory and the path that I was heading down. And it was in a healing component. Like it was in this space of, of acceptance and, and vision of where you wanted to go. Yeah, I was, I was, I want to say this. If you ever, or I was fortunate enough, I had a roommate at the time in Minneapolis and he bought a Ziploc bag of mycelium, magic mycelium, it's mushrooms. And I had never had the experience before, nor really know what it was. It's 2005 and the internet was fairly new. So we decide it was like three months out of training camp. We're all in tip top shape. And if there's a time to have an experience, it'd be now. So we decide we're going to eat some of these. And he and our other buddy were off, you know, goofing. And I remember sitting there and I'm somewhat, I'm healed from, from my surgery, but I'm sitting in a high chair on a table, high tabletop, just like this. And my whole system was just expanding and all the stress and the pressure that I had been experiencing was just not there. 
and I was having this moment of a healing experience. And then shortly, shortly uh, after that second training camp, I, I dabbled again, just alone. And I'm going to say this, these sac sacraments, you know, cannabis, mushrooms, other plant modalities that exist is not for everyone. And I highly recommend that if you are going to embark or work with these things, uh, there's someone that knows more than you or someone that has come from a lineage of practitioners or pages, medicine people that can help you through the process because they're very powerful and they should res be respected as such in my humble opinion. I so, agree. And I've done, and we've talked about this, I've done a shit ton of research on CBD, cannabis, uh, right. psychedelics, everything. And it's very, I'm a believer that there is such a healing component to that. It's poo-pooed in the general public. It's getting better. Mm -hmm. um, but I do believe that there is, if, if anybody that studies anything about energy and understanding about consciousness, and if you're talking about 5D consciousness, 5D awakening, all that kind of stuff, and understanding how energy, I said, I always tell people, the basic way I can explain it is if you walk into a room where there's a funeral and you can feel that energy of, of grief and sadness when you walk in, you may not have known the person that died, but you can sense that energy. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It's on right. the simplest level. That's that intu intuitive understanding of energy. And mm -hmm. when you do a psychedelic, whether it's uh, cybacillin or whatever, what, if, and DMT, whatever it is you end up trying to do, I always recommend, because I've seen way too many bad cases where I had a guy in Collegeville that did uh, synthetic DMT and his brain melted. I mean, he was, yeah, you know, he just took too much. So when your, your point is well taken that there are plenty of people out there now, if you just do use the internet <laughs> to your advantage, that you can find that are experts in this that are truly trying to help you go through the healing process or recover from pain, uh, medicine, addiction, or whatever the case might be. 100%. And I'm not even, I mean, I did what I did. And fortunately, um, I mean, let's look at opioids, right? Where's the opium come from? Mm -hmm. The poppy plant. It's from earth and it's, uh, is the word synthesized yep. to be taken orally to alleviate pain. We see a white pill, but there's plants in there. Right. So in that, in that, in that period of time, I was able to revisit. That's when I was able to, I was 240 pounds and hating myself at the time and learning to love myself simultaneously. And that's when I realized, wow, I was so controlled by everything outside of me that I was finally getting these moments to myself. And I said, there was a moment where I was just like, I don't care what anybody thinks anymore. What are, let me pull that list up of things that I hate about myself. I'm going to focus on all these. And if people have an issue with me, that has nothing to do with me. That has to do with them. And I wasn't expecting anyone to understand me or anyone to care. And one of the great things that happens to a, uh, a former professional athlete or high, high level performing person is that when you leave the glamour and that space, so does the crowd. Yeah. And you really, you know, people say, oh, that's so that's awful. That sucks that everybody goes away and nobody cares anymore. It's like, no, it's great because you learn there's only a few people that actually care. And I'm going to focus on them. Everybody else is a bunch of bullshit. I'm not saying they didn't contribute and help in some way at some moment. But for the most part, people are just hanging on because you're the, the hot topic, right? Or you're the star and people want to be around stars. It's, it's, it's what it is. 
so I was in that moment. I was just like, I don't, I'm, I'm going to paint. I'm going to act. I'm going to produce. I'm going to make music. I'm going to do all this shit that I've been holding back and suppressing because I want to do it. And because this is who I, this is a part of me. I have music in me. I have characters in me. I have archetypes, whatever you want to call it. It's all alive in me. And I'm going to work there first. How do I get back to that space of flow, right? Because that's ultimate, that's flow is a big trendy word right now. That's what people refer to it as source, flow, connection. I got to get back to nature, my nature and that was it was really after football because i what else was i going to do i learned what didn't work for me in that experience um but i knew i had a long way to go and because of that experience and the discipline and the focus and the amount of work i put into it i was like if i could do that there's nothing i can't do it's as simple as that. Now, there's, you know, a lot of factors, challenges, and things that may come up. It's like, but I'm prepared for that. It's like, you know, I lost my best friend. That seems pretty shitty, but he taught me so much that it would behoove me not to live with what he taught me, right? Right. The league, most everybody says, oh, you didn't have the career that you, <laughs> that you wanted. I had the career that I had, and I'm okay with that. What is? How do I stay with what is and, 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 and work from there and build from there? Because I just built this 240-pound meathead. If I could do that then I just need to figure out how to transition all that juju and energy into these other things that I want to do. And it was, it was, I would say it was, it was those moments in Minnesota with the, with the, the mushrooms. It was also, you know, a lot of things that happened to me in college because I started taking theater classes uh, my last two years. And I was like, this is rad. I had to go to, to um, university-sponsored performances as a part of credit for my class. We had to go to three. And I remember sitting in the audience, and I was just like, I don't want to be here. I want to be there on stage. I was like, I'm not capable of it at this point with me. But I remember sitting in the chair by myself just watching, like, this is fun. I want to have fun. I want to do things that are challenging because it's going to bring out the best of me. It's going to force me to grow and I want to have fun while I'm here. And so um, the one thing that I didn't have a, a great focal point on while I was playing was emotional intelligence and consciousness, um, which is ultimately self-development, right? And so I said on this transition, I was like, I need to focus there. And I'm not sure I know what that is, but I'm going to start with that idea. And that's when fear was the closest thing to me that made sense in terms of development. And so I just focused on everything that I feared. I knew I was going to be in New York City because something in me is like, even when I, when I was going through the draft, people were like, where do you want to go? I was like, I want to play for the Giants. They're like, what? You're from Philly, not the Eagles? I was like, no, I want to be in New York. I was like, something in New York is calling me. And I don't really, it was just something intuitive. I needed to be in New York. Uh, there's something about the vibrancy. You know, I've never been a traditional educate or a traditional school learner. I'm very much life. Um, I can sit and memorize stuff, but it's, to me, it's, I need, I want active experience very much the same way right and so i knew in those moments in minnesota that i was going to end up in new york for a long period of my life because that's where my education was 
He's like, yeah, I got the degree. I started a second degree because I didn't care about a master's. And I started a second degree in like coaching and nutrition. Nutrition was important or is important. Um, coaching is all anthropology, basically, and sociology, psychology, stuff like that. And so, and a lot of my classes I focused on were in the communications emphasized after spending three years in economics and, and stuff like that. And so I was like, I, I knew I was going to end up in New York, which is eventually ultimately where I went after another short stint uh, back, back here in trap. It's, you know, and the intuitiveness of what you you've gone through and whether it was conscious or unconscious or recognized or unrecognized that that was what was guiding you. You know, I think there is a there is that inner voice that that third eye, whatever it is that that creates that self awareness and that confidence enough to know that what you're willing to take the risk of going to whatever that that intuition is telling you that your gut is telling you to do. That's an important part of emotional intelligence is having the balance between the confidence in your own abilities and your own capabilities and enough humility to know that you don't know everything and you need to learn, right? There's a, there's a fine balance between those two things. And just hearing you explain very eloquently your, your journey, you've had the, the, the tug of war for a little while during periods of your life between those two, between the, the balance between the humility and wanting to know, not knowing that you don't know everything and then that self-awareness and knowing that you're very good at what it is you do, i.e. your ability to communicate with Coach Rod or lack thereof and the relationship and your, you were talking about having a little bit too, too much ego and didn't want to put some things aside and whatever, but you've grown through the, the, the catalyst. I would probably argue the catalyst is your, your best friend dying and that consciously or unconsciously or triggered in you the awakening of your intuition and allowed you through moments and gracious moments to identify where your growth was occurring. And that's important. Most people don't realize that. I, I tell it in my book, I talk about for 13 years, I didn't see shit, not a fucking thing. I only saw whatever was put in front of me that I knew was real, that I could accomplish and task driven. That's all I cared about. And I always, there were so many things looking back and we can all be retrospective. And when you write your life story, you, you do it rather deeply. There were so many doors that were open for me and opportunities that were pre presented to me that may not have been overt, but were there that I never noticed or saw hmm. because I was so driven by anger and, and the fear of, of not accomplishing. Cause one of my, my biggest things I thought about my brother being special needs and autistic and stuttering and us growing up in poverty and, but no dad and all that, the whole shit story is that at the age of 21, he never had a chance to live. Like he was just in my, in my version of my brother, the memories I have of my brother, he was just starting to sort of figure it out where he fit in as this weird kid that stuttered and didn't really have communicative abilities and was awkward socially and uh, didn't make good eye contact, like all these nuances of aut autism. But he was just starting to figure it out, and then he was he was taken. But what I realized after 13 years of being angry and then having a chance to relive our life together and talk to people who knew my brother in a different way than I did. My brother worked at a camp called Camp Anaba, which was out in Chester County, every summer. He would cut grass and do shit like that, but he lived there for two months every summer, lived at the camp. Having spoke after I wrote the book, I had a lot of people come to book signings and there were a lot of people that knew my brother through the camp. And what I realized was that I was angry thinking my brother didn't live when he lived more than any person could ever live in 21 years. The impacts he made on people's lives, there are people that named their child after my brother. I don't even know who these people were. They built a gymnasium and named it after my brother at this camp. They raised $400,000 or something in my brother's name. Like, Shit like that, like I don't, I don't even know how you live that good of a life, that that impactful of a life in 21 years, but he did. Mm -hmm. So what I was angry about was bullshit. He lived the fuck out of his life. 
but it was comp- what I believed living was and what he did were two different things. And that's when I realized what living is. I was working towards having as many fucking amazing moments in my life thinking that that's what life was a scorecard, right? Mm-hmm. All the greatness that I could possibly. So if I die tomorrow, if my days, my tickets punched, fuck it. I know I, I dominated life for as long as I was here, but I wasn't living. I was just knocking shit off checklists. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's when I learned what living was. And that's when I understood. And I think your growth, you've been blessed. I would say in having a, an awareness that those moments were growth moments. I didn't see any of those things until I was 30, 35 years old when I finally had my moment. You know, so that's, I, I think one of the brilliances of your life is that you've, you've been able to experience things knowing that your intuition is guiding you. Thank you. It's been ignored a lot too. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> and I think that's out of, and I, and to me, one of the most challenging things is getting over our own arrogance our own idea of what we're doing <clears throat> and really i think arrogance um and any any other thing that kind of takes us out of the moment and when we when we commit to a moment meaning now presence then and it, I, f- I feel like it takes, it, or for me anyways, it took for all of these things to happen to get me to be present. And I remember when uh, I, I was fortunate to study with a master, can't even call him a master acting teacher. He's a masterful human because he's seen so many people come through his studio to be actors or, or for whatever reason they were there primarily to be actors that he, he could similarly to what are your skills is being able to read people. He can read, he could, he just knew what chord in every single person that needed to be plucked in order to open up another side of them, not necessarily even for, the role that we were rehearsing or preparing for, but just for just being a per a human. And he could also tell the people that weren't willing to open up that just wanted to keep acting that weren't willing to open up that part of them. So they didn't really last in the program. William Esper, uh, I was fortunate to study with for three years And he said to me in my exit, we had an exit interview and he said to me, and at this point I'm, I'm 20, 28 years old and I'm still very much caught up in a, you know, do you think I'm good or you you think I'll be successful? You think, and he wasn't about any of that bullshit. He just paused and looked at me and he said, you're finally starting to act like yourself. And I was like, like in my mind, I was like, I don't even know what that means. Right. <laughs> Cause I'm thinking, like, myself, I'm like, wait, I'm like, what? I was like, is, is, does that mean I'll be good? Or you think I'll be pro- professional or whatever? He's like, and then he stopped again. He looked at me. He's like, you're finally starting to act like yourself. And that was it. And then we shot the shit for, you know, 10 more minutes. And I was like, I remember leaving the studio and I was like, I don't really fully know what he means by that in terms of theatrics, because his goal was just that I need his goal was to get each of us to act, to be ourselves and then help us figure out how to take that authentic us and form or develop a character with actual emotion, with actually being present as this character using our natural uh, emotions. And, 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 you know, as an artist, it's like, you got to use whatever you got to use to be whatever you got to be. 
as, as a performer, but he wanted us to open up our core. And so looking back on, it, I was like, Oh, and I remember walking out. I was like, well, I don't, I, I don't necessarily know what that means, but I'm just going to focus on that. And then all of the other tools that, that came with it in the other classes. And that is, uh, a piece of advice that I'll always live with and continue to focus on. Well, brother, Can I we think pause for a second. I got to pee. Yeah. We're, I'm going to do a little, uh, little promo right. here and then you go, you go hit the head. All right. Go Can I go now? Yeah, you can go now. Yeah. This is what happens when you're running a show with no editing. Sometimes someone's got to take a leak. We're an hour and a half into this roughly. So um, first of all, Grant has been phenomenal for those of you that, um, <clears throat> are interested in, in personal stories and, and authentic stories. You know, you don't get much real than this, much more real than this. And, you know, I ask questions with trying to elicit responses and his responses were, were phenomenal. His ability to um, communicate moments in his life and the way that, that it impacted him and uh, sort of paint the picture. You can tell he's got the, the skill of, uh, oratory painting as i call it um and i'm i'm thankful that he came on i'm gonna ask him one more question when he comes back and then we're gonna wrap this thing up um and like i said it's you know, i try to keep things um with a natural conclusion i think we're coming up on that um here he comes back back from taking a leak ladies and gentlemen grant wiley he is now a pound lighter and uh 40 pounds lighter <laughs> So listen, we're gonna we're gonna wrap you up. I'm gonna ask one more question for you. Uh -huh. How's this going for you? Oh, it's great, dude. Nice. Good. I was just I just gave a nice little shout out to you on 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 how you how well you paint an oratory picture um, hmm. when when you're speaking. So thank you. Um, but I have one more question, and and it's a it's a retrospective, introspective question. Um, and I I answered this question myself from myself many times and, and i like to ask it to certain guests who have the ability to answer it or who i believe have the ability to answer it when my brother died it was the worst day of my life but i can also say it was the greatest gift i ever received because i wouldn't be who i am today had he not died i'm a hundred percent certain of that i know the direction i was heading i know who i was at that moment it was a um conflicted young man who um had no idea who he was and i don't think i would have gotten to this point in my life or had as much um success in my life personally and professionally had it not been for my brother die and so it was the greatest gift I ever gotten the worst day of my life is there and i and i would never i would if I could go back and rewrite my life, I wouldn't because I believe every single thing that's ever happened to me and happened for me was meant to get me to where I am right now. And I was saying, you are where you are when you're supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. And I would never rewrite my life. I don't have any regrets. I don't have, I, I just live my life without them. I, I believe I live intentionally. So therefore there's no reason to apologize. I don't do things haphazardly anymore. I don't do things knee jerk. Everything I do has intention, even when it's to piss somebody off. So I don't apologize for those things and it helps me grow as a person. So my question for you is if you had a chance to rewrite your life hmm. and remove any piece or add a piece, would you and what would it be? I'm, I mean, I'm very similar in, in my idea of existence as you are in that I do believe in regrets, like regretting not talking to that, that woman that you just walked by, like, why not? The worst she's going to say is no, you know what I mean? Or regretting and not approaching somebody that you actually have a question for at a that spoke at some seminar or something like that 
So, I mean, there's, there's, I think, but even to, to, to what you just said is like, those moments have given me the strength to do it now. Exactly. And gave me the fuck you to my own doubter Mm -hmm. internally, like, shut up voice. I'm going to talk to these people or I'm going to do these things. Uh, so I don't really, I'm, I'm, I'm of the same, the same way in that. Cause even, you know, when I was, when I was abusing, but fortunately I don't have an addictive personality, but when I was abusing pain pills and I went through three periods of withdrawals, nobody told me it was, you know, there was opium in these things. <laughs> I just knew they were numbing me and it felt great for me to not be facing the truth and then having even having those periods of three straight horribly feeling sleepless cold sweaty nights i realized yeah i'm not going to do this anymore or i don't i'm going to focus on this earth medicine that exists so I don't really live. uh, I believe I've accumulated because I don't even believe in like my age or age in general. I feel like how can I feel younger at my age today than I did when I was 18? I felt like I had the whole world on my shoulders when I was 18 just to get out of here, just to get to this, this next level of dream. So I don't really... I believe I need to just stay committed to my youth. I did a I did a an art presentation called the deconstruction of an American football player, and it's pieces I created from from two thousand eight or two thousand seven to two thousand eleven. No, sorry, 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 two thousand seven to two thousand eighteen. Eleven years of what I believe I deconstructed the American football player, and 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 I it hasn't gotten critical acclaim, but I don't care Would I like it to, of course, that's fun too, but it it was more about a growth journey and, and look at all this shit that I created just to get it, get these things out of me. Um, And so I don't, I'm going to continue to do and achieve my goals and dreams moving forward understanding what happened in the past not being attached to it but and i'm gonna i'm gonna screw up i'm gonna continue to make mistakes and maybe fall into old patterns but i'm gonna get out of them more quickly now than i did then i know that um so i don't really i could say i should have focused on the nba (laughs) because <laughs> i remember growing up here is when kobe ai rich hamilton basketball was and i was eighth ninth grade i was like i want to play in the ncaa tournament that's awesome and i was i was teetering on on focusing on basketball or football but you can't hit people on the basketball court that's true yeah. well i did that's how i made yeah, that's why you didn't play much until until they need the enforcer. That's it. Five minutes. Five <laughs> fouls, five that's it. Use all five fouls. I only Foul have five minutes to play, so I'm getting them all. <laughs> yeah. But listen, hang tight. We're going to talk off the air. Um, I'm going to close out the show. Everybody, first of all, thank you, Grant, for being thank on you. the show. This um, we're going to do another show because I think there's a second show in us on a completely different plane that I think we need to tackle um, at some point in time. But um, today's I think was really it, it just naturally went this direction and, and it's how it felt like it needed to go so um, I hope everybody enjoyed this episode of the two dates in a dash podcast um, once again I'm your host Matt Kubler um, if you want to learn more about Grant where can they hear where, where can they reach you Grant Wiley Grant 33 at gmail.com all right if you want to reach Grant, W I L E Y G R A N T three three at gmail.com. That's where you can reach Grant if you want to 
hire for acting, speaking, art. Come on your podcast. Leadership. Leadership. Uh, getting your you shit together laugh. in life. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Email Grant there. Um, if you want to learn more about me, once again, mattkubler.com. Remember to go to YouTube, Matt Kubler. Subscribe. And when you uh, subscribe on an audio podcast, just make sure you uh, hit that automatic download button. Everybody, God bless and go out and be kind to one another. Take your bird.